Hello YouTube fans, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you guys how to quickly get started uh, with RoboMotion. And towards the end of this video, I'll be demonstrating an invoice manager that will allow you to read PDFs locally and create records in a table. So we're going to be taking advantage of Straco's API and we're going to be using their API to analyze the PDF uh, using AI. So if this sounds exciting to you, let's jump right in. RoboMotion is a low-code cloud-based Robomotic process automation platform that's designed to help you create software bots that can automate almost anything in the computer, whether it's uh, data entry, managing invoice, or even uh, monitor websites. So what's special about uh, RoboMotion is that you have the ability to perform all these types of automation, whether you need some sort of API or browser automation. But what's cool thing about RoboMotion specifically is that you can also do some automation within your local PC. So if you want to work within the files in your uh, personal computer, you can also do some automation and you can run RoboMotion's bot on another server, not just on your local PC. You can run it on your cloud server or you can also run it on your own VPS server somewhere else. So you have total control how to run automation scenarios. While RoboMotion is great, it has a lot of strengths. It has a lot of features. It's also, it's becoming its weakness because there's a lot of things that you can do with this tool and i've seen a lot of feedbacks from users stating how difficult it is to work with this tool because there's so much things that you can do with it but hopefully by the end of this video you should have enough knowledge to be proficient and build your first automation so i'm going to be showing you guys everything that you need to know to get started with robomotion so if you're brand new to my channel my name is dennis and i'm a principal software engineer and i do videos on coding automation and ai and I do this on a weekly basis. So if you like this type of content, please go and consider subscribing to my channel and um, giving this video a like. I'm also running a school community where I post some exclusive contents and templates, one of which is gonna be the one that I'm gonna be demonstrating today, which is for managing your invoices using AI. So I'm gonna be posting this template in the community as well. Hopefully you can join us and I'll see you there. So without further ado, let's get started with the video. All right, so let me go and demonstrate what we're going to be building today. So you can see here, I'm within the directory RoboMotion in my C drive, and then I have this folder called invoices. So I try to keep everything RoboMotion related as close as possible to the main drive so I can easily find it and do whatever I need to do within the RoboMotion platform. But within RoboMotion, I have this invoices folder which contains all the different invoices PDF that I'm going to be using to demonstrate for this video. So I have three invoices for the, the different customers. And I also have an empty directory here, which is for completed. So what's going to happen is we're going to be using RoboMotion to process each of these PDF for each of these customers. And as we process each of these files individually, we're going to be uh, moving it into the completed directory. So we, let's go ahead and take a look at what's inside of these invoices. There's the customer information on the top, who to build to, the invoice ID, which is 100, and then the invoice date. Let's go ahead and open this up more. The invoice total is $850 for this person. And then we have a separate line for each item for the service rendered. So I have three service rendered here, one for web design, which amounts for $500, and then logo creation for $200 and then social media management for $150, which in total is $850 for this person, right? So let's go and check out Sarah Johnson. Her case, you have a different invoice ID, same date, and then a different invoice total, just to kind of keep a variety between different customers. So we're going to have a $1,200 here total, and then a description. We have four different services rendered for this person. So we have one for graphic design for $450, content writing for $250, digital marketing for $400, and then email marketing for $100. And then the last person is Michael Brown, which we only have one service rendered for this one person. And then it amounts to $600 and then $600 total for that, for that photography that we just did for him. So what we're going to do is we're going to be processing these files. As we process each file, it's going to be moved into the completed folder. But essentially, we're going to be processing each file. We're going to be using Stracos API. We're going to be uploading these PDF into the API server uh, for Straco. And then we're going to be using Straco to analyze the content within individual PDF. And then we're going to be using Straco to extract key information that we need, such as the invoice date, the customer information, 
each services that we rendered for each one. I'm going to be showing you guys all this in a little bit, but there's a prompt that I'm going to be using in this video that also use Draco to generate. So let's go and take a look at a table real quick. So just to kind of keep this demonstration simple, I just did a flat one data sheet, which for each service rendered for a customer, I'm just going to create a new record inside of this data sheet. The first field is just an ID, which is an auto number to create a unique number for each record. And then we're going to be also including the invoice ID. We're going to be inserting the invoice ID for each of the service rendered. And then the customer information is going to be a single line text. The invoice date is also a single line text. And then we're going to be also going to be adding the service rendered, which is going to be underneath the service field name, which is a single line text. The amount is going to be a single line text as well. So that's going to be a pretty simple A table data sheet that we have set up for this uh, demonstration. But let's go and take a look at RoboMotion. So what we're going to be working with today. So just kind of show you a high level of what's going on here. Don't worry about the nuances and the little details of what this automation entails for now, but I'm going to be explaining everything in more details in a little bit. But essentially there's maybe for like five sections here, you can see five that we're going to be working with today, route them up and make things simpler. So the first group is to set up the whole automation, setting up the variables, pulling out the authorization API key. And then we're going to be listing out the directory. We're going to be setting the directory to point to the local directory that I have shown you guys earlier. And then we're going to do some filtering here. And that's going to be the first step. But the second step of the process is going through each of those files within that directory that I just mentioned earlier. And then the third group is to upload each of those individual invoice PDF into Straco API to be processed. We're going to be using AI to analyze each of those in invoices, we're going to be using AI to extract the content so we can extract the service rendered, the customer information, the invoice date and invoice ID and everything that we need to extract from that PDF document. So once we have the actual information, the data, we're going to go to AI table and we're going to be adding each of those individual services rendered inside of AI table. Let's go ahead and zoom in real quick. We're going to go and do the cleanup process, which is then is going to move each individual file into the completed directory. So as we process each file, that file is going to be moved into the completed directory. But we also have an optional part, which is for exception handling, just in case something happens along the way. I just have a section where there's something that happens within when it's trying to move a file. It's just going to go and keep moving along through the automation process and not stop. So that's the whole point. And then in the end, it's just going to hit stop. And that's the end of the automation. So just to demonstrate how everything works, I'm just going to go and minimize my screen here and minimize this. You can see here that I have the RoboMotion running in the background in my task manager and I have my workspace for coding menace. I currently have two robots connected, one for the prod and one for development. So let's go back to a table. So you can see here, I don't have any data currently. And then I have the invoice directory all currently set up. Um, this is the starting point. Uh, whenever you start off this automation, it's going to look at this directory and it's going to look for the uh, the files that's non-directory. So which is like all these uh, PDF. So let's go and start the automation and we can do that by hitting this icon. If I have some cloud minutes, I can also run this on the cloud. Uh, but since I'm running my files locally, it's safe to say that I can run the local version. It's always going to be available as long as the robot is connected from my machine to the RoboMotion cloud. Let's go ahead and run this. And then from here, I can select one of these robots that I have available that's connected to my machine. I'm going to go and pick the first one, which was just for development. I'm going to go ahead and run and let's go back to invoices. So it's going to be running and it's going to be working against these files. As it runs through the automation, you can see the green light pops up for each of these step along this automation. You can see here that it's analyzing in the Straco environment right now. It looks like I missed a step here, which looks like it just gets disconnected. Let me try and rerun this. <laughs> I don't know why it was disconnected, but let's go and run it again. All right, so it's analyzing in Straco right now. It's sending the PDF. Now it's gone through and added to Airtable. And then let's go back to invoices. You can see here 
the files are slowly being moved into the completed folder. So all the files has to now be completed. So all this without me doing anything manually. So if you go back to a table, you can see all the different records that we have now in a table for each of the customers. There's a separate line for each of the serv service rendered, including the invoice ID, and then the total amount uh, for each one. You can even go, go and verify that if you want and uh, go to Sarah Johnson, which has uh, four service rendered, one for graphic design. I can go and cross check this. So for Sarah Johnson, there's graphic design for 450, uh, content writing for 250, and then digital marketing for $400. And then lastly, for email marketing for a hundred bucks. And then the total is 1200, which we're not really recording. It's underneath the invoice of 101, right? And this is the invoice date is 8-7-2024. You can see that it matches what we have on the invoice. So that's pretty much the automation that we're going to be building today. I'm going to be showing you guys step by step on how to build this. Hope that you are excited. So when I first was starting to uh, generate some ideas for what I want to demonstrate in this video, I was kind of struggling a little bit because I want to highlight the uh, different features compared to the other automation tools that's out there or what I have been able to showcase in my channel. So eventually I landed on the idea of being able to process PDF documents and having the ability to read the content of the PDF and then extract the data and analyze it. And you can apply this particular concept into many different scenarios out there. But this is one example of how you can accomplish with this type of automation. My first option when we first uh, settled on the idea of this type of automation was to use um, OpenAI's vision. Uh, which is to convert the PDF into an image and then we can use vision to uh, analyze the, the image and then pull up certain information about the PDF. Uh, we can describe it, we can extract certain contents from it. And then soon I realized when I was playing with Stracos API that you actually have this ability already in their API. So if you go to their API, as part of prompt completion version one, you can actually upload a file on the server and you can submit the file URLs that you previously uploaded to Straco and then you can use that as a context for future conversation when you make a request to the Straco API. Just to kind of prove the point, so I'm here in Straco, so I'm going to be using the same PDF that I used earlier for the invoice. Let's go and drop, drag and drag and drop one of these PDF right into Straco. You can see here that I'm just dragging straight into the Straco environment. So now I can see here that there's a message that the file has been added into the, the context of this conversation. So I'm just going to go and copy the prompt that I'm using uh, within RoboMotion. So this is the prompt that I'm going to be using later on to extract the data from RoboMotion or from this PDF document. So I'm going to go and paste that here where the prompt is. So the prompt reads as act as an expert invoice generator return only a JSON object with no markdown formatting. So I noticed that they're returning a, a markdown format for the code, so, so which I'm eliminating here by specifying that I don't want any markdown formatting and then based on the input details of the service provided. So we are within the context of the invoice PDF. So it knows exactly what we're talking about here. And then I'm describing the JSON object that should include the following properties. So the services would be an array of objects where each object contains description in a string describing the service, and then the amount, a string denoting the amount charged for the service. And then the total would be outside of the array of services. So you're gonna have a array of services, and then you're gonna have a total, and then a customer property, and then the invoice, which is the invoice number. We could have been more specific there by specifying invoice number, but we just went with invoice here, but it's an invoice number. And then invoice date would be the invoice date. So we're just going to see if we can read what's on the PDF that we just uploaded and then ensure that the JSON object is well structured and actually reflects the provided details. Let's go and hit this one. And one thing you also notice that I'm using GPT-4 Omini. You can see here that it's rendering now a response. Uh, usually it wraps the response in a markdown format. You can see here that as a valid JSON in a string here, which has the services with an array, including all the different type of services rendered for that client. 
and then the total and then the person's name and the invoice. So we basically can apply the same principle when it comes to dealing with it in the automation fashion using their API. So let's go and, and quickly go through the Straco API's documentation here real quick. This is a two-step process where you first need to upload the file into the server and then you can call on this prompt completion where we can then pass in the file URLs. It's not a requirement to pass this in, but it's an array of URLs up to four. And then you can pass in the models. You can use multiple models if you want multiple completions and then the message. And then if you want to extract some YouTube URLs, you can do that as well, which we're not going to be doing in this case. But the two things that are required are the models and the message and then the file URLs, which we're going to be grabbing from the previous step. So the first step in this process is we're going to be using the file upload. So we're going to go into the file upload documentation here. This is the endpoint to upload files for use in the prompt completion v1 endpoint. So this one accepts a request body of a file parameter with a type of file. And then the response would be the URL. We're also requiring this to be a content type of multi-part of form form dash data, which I'm going to be showing you guys how to set up later on inside the Robin Motion platform. And that's going to be it. And then it's, it's going to give us a URL, which we can then use in the next step, which is for the prompt completion V1, which is in this case, we're going to be passing in the file URLs. So that's going to be the first step. So we talked about what Robin Motion is. Like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be doing a walkthrough of the platform. We're going to be talking about the templates, packages, vaults, robots, proxies, so you can have a better understanding of using RoboMotion so you can easily just quickly get started. We're going to be building this automation using RoboMotion to, ma to manage your invoice. So we're going to be grabbing the PDF invoice. We're going to be sending it to Stracos API, and then we're going to be flushing that in into a table to create records. And then this whole concept of workspace, we talked about a little bit of workspace. It's based on an organization or agency. If you're managing an organization or agency, uh, you can have multiple bots and different scenarios within that organization. So you have to sign into your individual workspace before you can create your flow. You can run your RoboMotion locally. When you install the RoboMotion robot, you have access to the CLI, which allows you to run and connect to the robot through the command line interface, in which case you have these parameters, which allows you to connect to the different workspace and use your email address to connect to your workspace. And then you can connect to different robots. I just want to show you what type of things that we're going to be covering today. So the different use case for RoboMotion RPA, you can do some web scraping. They have a web recorder extension that will allow you to easily web scrape contents without having some knowledge of CSS selectors, which can be beneficial. It's there if you need it. You can also automate your desktop as well as some web such as browser type of task and also API type of automation. So all these use case is available within RoboMotion. As far as features is concerned, I try to break it up into different chunks so you can clearly understand the different parts of this tool. And so I try to dissect it a little bit so you can clearly understand it. So from the feature standpoint, you can see here that the robot, it consists of a, a robot. To, you can have multiple robots running within your account, just depending on what type of limits you have in your account. Uh, you can run within the cloud environment or local by connecting this robot into your task manager. Uh, the next thing here is the nodes, which we're going to be talking about this in more detail. Just to give you a general overview here of what we're going to be talking about in this video. But we're going to be talking about the nodes, uh, which has input, output, and options. We're going to be clearing this up. It's so just don't worry about this for now. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, the variables, what type of variables you have. They have global and flow type of variables. And then you can assign different types. So if you are familiar with programming, depending on the programming language that you're using, there's usually different data types that you can use. So the string, integer, this Boolean, this double, this array and an object. So we can talk about this a little bit uh, later on, but just kind of continuing here and just going through the different concepts that we're going to be covering in this video. There's also these programming concepts where you kind of have to learn how things work on a programmatic sense. 
There's switches, which allows you to control the flow in your automation project, depending on what type of case. If it's one, then we're going to go and process this. If it's two, then it's going to go to this particular part of the flow. I'm going to be also going to be showing you guys all these, such as how to debug your project. And then we're going to be using some sleep as well. And then I'm going to be showing you guys a pretty big part of the automation, which is the for each and a function. So it allows you to do iteration for an array, which is pretty important. So let's go ahead and scroll down. There's also some web automation modules as well, which allows you to click on the page, open up the browser, run some, some scripts. There's run script and then there's a function, which I can also tell you guys in a little bit what the difference between the two. You can send the keystrokes that you press on the keyboard. You can send that in as part of the web automation. You can send values to the input, wait an element. So some typical stuff that you would perform uh, in a web uh, browser type of automation scenario. Screenshots, setting the cookie, scrolling down the page, all that kind of stuff. The vault, storing your authentication keys and passwords, and then the apps. So some of this I'm not really going to be covering, such as the proxies. I'm going to be covering maybe some of the templates, but there's so much to cover in one video. And I'm trying to keep it simple to not overwhelm you with all this information. So I'm trying to be more lenient here as far as what type of um, information I can provide in one video. But I can cover this in other uh, videos, but I just want to keep it simple for now and just cover some of the main things that's available in RoboMotion. Let's look into the RoboMotion website, starting with the templates. So you can see here that there's tons of templates available that you can use right now that's available for different type of scenario and automation tasks that you need. So for instance, there's tracking projects for Airtable. There's an Amazon S3 quick start, some scraping scenarios to scrape search result in Amazon, collect pair price on Binance, all of these automation available for you to use. So you can click on these and then you can just clone it in your environment and then you're ready to go. So you have to be logged in to do that. The only thing that I would advise you to do is when you're first starting out and using RoboMotion, I wouldn't use any of these templates and use it out of the box because it can get frustrating, especially that you don't know how to use um, certain tools. Some of these automations are quite complex and troubleshooting it would be a nightmare, especially if you're just starting out and you don't know exactly what's happening uh, inside the code and how everything works. So I would use these templates, start out with something, for instance, like a check API health, something simple, and just learn it and just dissect it and see what's happening behind the scenes so you can apply it to your own simple scenario or project. I wouldn't use this uh, out of the box. I know it's kind of counterintuitive because it's a template, but some of these templates can be overly complicated that uh, it, I don't want you to get frustrated with working with robot motion off the bat that I would wait a little bit, but I would definitely check out these templates and see how it works and then apply some of the bits and pieces into a simple project that you create from scratch and then just go from there. I wouldn't use it automatically to start off the automation and think that it's just going to work like magic. So. That's the first thing that I want to point out here before we log into RoboMotion. So let's go ahead and jump into the RoboMotion platform. So when you first sign up, you have to create a workspace. So a workspace is an agency or organization that you can manage. And each of these workspace allow multiple robots, just depending on the plan. You can create automation within the confine of the robot that's set up for that workspace. So we're going to be using this. We're going to be logging into our workspace. So mine is Coding Menace. And then I'm just going to be putting my username and my password here. Let's go and build this automation from scratch. So first things first, before we start this automation, is that you need to grab the, the Straco API key if you don't have it. So you can go to your settings and go to your, my profile. If you go here to the top right, you can see the icon and then go to your settings and then scroll down to the bottom and you'll see your API key. The next thing that you need to get is the, when you finish creating your data sheet to get a hold of your API key, you can access the API key by going to the API on the top and then you can toggle this show API token, which is then gonna expose your API key when you click on one of these tabs. Another thing to take a note here when you're working with a table is pay attention to the, the actual URL here. 
which is going to be unique to your data sheet that you set up. It's going to have the data sheet starts with the DST and then up to the records. So it's just going to be copying this one and that's going to be the URL that's going to be required to be able to work with a table records. So either we get records or add records. This is going to be the URL that we're going to be using in addition to the API token. So that's the two pieces of information that we need as far as a table is concerned. And then, yeah, we can go and start working on this automation inside RoboMotion. So you have to go back to the top and click on where the project is and then click on new project. In this case, I already created a new one. I just named this Invoice Manager P2. So that's what I named it. Next thing that we're gonna do is to set up the Vault. This is pretty important that we're gonna be using this later on to access, access the API key for this Draco and AI table. So might as well handle these things now so we don't have to worry about it later on. You're gonna have to enter your password here. Let's go and click open. And then you're gonna have to create a vault if you don't have any vault yet. So you're gonna go ahead and create a vault. And then this is gonna allow you to name your vault to whatever you want. Let's say I wanna create a vault. Let's say I wanna I wanna do a YouTube demo. That's gonna be the, the name of the vault. And then you have to add a description here, a description and then you can create. So you can see here that I'm presented with a private key. This is something that you need to store somewhere safe because once you lose this, you won't be able to open up your vault anymore. So you have to make sure that you store this somewhere safe and you're gonna be needing to inject this later on into your bot so that you can open up your vault and access the API tokens or whatever else is stored in the vault. So I'm just gonna go and paste it somewhere so it's safe. I'm gonna go and click OK. And then from here, I can just delete that since I really don't need it. So I'm going to go and delete. So I'm going to type in YT demo to delete it. So once you have your vault available, now if you want to store your API key or a table key, you just need to create a new item and you're going to be using API key slash token for that. And you're just going to be naming this to something that's more descriptive. And then you're going to be pasting the value here. Same thing with the AA table key. So you're going to have to repeat that. So now I have a straight code API key here, and then I have the A table API key here as well. So just make sure that you have your private key safe somewhere and make sure that you store it somewhere where you're not going to lose it. So go ahead and close this one. So that's going to be the first step. And the second step is to find a location within uh, your local directory. So if you're running on Windows, I'm using Windows here, uh, just find a local directory uh, where you're going to be storing all your RoboMotion projects, where the artifacts going to live. In my case, I'm going to be storing it inside of this RoboMotion invoice. So this is going to be the starting point of the project and I have a empty, so I'm going to go ahead and move the PDF uh, files in the main, in the main drive. Let's go ahead and close that. So I have the completed directory here, which is empty inside and then I have three PDF here so I can do some testing with this automation. So, but it's going to be the target directory here is the invoices. This is where I'm going to be looking for files. I'm going to be listing all the files within the, this directory and then I need to make sure that I capture that. So I'm going to go and copy that, go to the top and just copy the path to that directory. So what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be storing this inside of a variable. So I'm going to be call calling this to go to tab at the bottom. You're going to be uh, doing a plus here and I'm going to be start storing the value to the variable here, which is the path to my directory. So instead of doing a backward slash, I'm going to go and do a another slash in front of it. So now the path looks like this. So I have uh, two double backward slash for each one that's separating each directory. I'm going to be setting this globally for now, since there's no reason to keep the, the scope in flow. So I'm going to keep it as a global and then the variable type is going to be a string and I'm going to be naming this voices uh, there. So lowercase is going to be a camel case, it's going to be lowercase invoices and then dir would be a directory, right? So now I have the, the vault set up, I have the variable set up. Uh, now I can start with the actual automation. All right, so when you first start an automation, you usually start with an inject which you can type in by typing in inject and it lives underneath the trigger package. You see here that you can drill down to that trigger. You can also come down here to trigger where it is 
and you can just go and drag it on your screen. So this is going to be the starting point for any or most of the automation that you do in RoboMotion. And you can change the name of the, you can change the color of this, or you can name this however you want. Let's say you want to name this to start, you can do that, or you can keep it an inject. Some node might have an input. In this case, this one has a JS date dot now, which is being injected into this payload message output. When you do an automation in RoboMotion, the message that you, that you pass within the automation lives in this message object. So this is where you're going to be storing all the different values. And over time, you're going to have to pay attention that because message could get cluttered with all the different variables that you set in it. The next thing that we're going to be doing is a good habit to have is to create a function here, which in my case, I'm just using it to do a setup. So if I want to declare certain things within uh, my automation, for instance, I want to set up what the initial value is for uh, certain things before the automation starts. I want to go and set the message here. I'm going to go and set set this one to the variable and we're going to grab the global variable from the invoice there that we have set up earlier. So I'm just assigning it to the message dot invoices dot invoices there DIR, which is now it's going to be exposed when I return this message. So whenever you run a function, you always return a message MSG. And then you can use this function to massage data or you can add new variables to it, new properties, and then you can uh, manipulate it and do whatever you need. You can do some basic uh, JavaScript stuff. You can't really do more advanced asynchronous call here. You can't really do high level JavaScript here. You can just do basic manipulation of data and you can do stuff where we can grab the global variables. You can extract certain things, but you can't really do much beyond that within the scope of a function. So let's go and save this one. And we're going to call this setup is essentially what this is doing. Let's go and highlight this and let's go to the property on the right hand side and let's call this setup and I'm going to click enter and then let's continue from there. So now when I, when I attach a debug on this one, so I can go and attach another node to this one by, by just going and dragging from that end. And I'm just going to go and I can just pick from the pop up here and choose debug. So now I can listen for any events where this is attached to. One of the options that you can use when you're doing a debug is you don't have to put anything, which means that this message is going to be dumped into the output window at the bottom. If you fire this up, so let's say, assuming that you already have a robot connection, let's go and pick one. When we do an output, you're going to see at the bottom the output of what we've set inside the messages. So inside of the setup, we set up the invoice DIR, which is now uh, pointing or being assigned this global variable of the path inside of our Windows directory for invoices. So now I can input whatever I want to in this window. I can do some debugging or whatever just by doing that. I can also output a specific values. So for instance, if, just, if I just want to listen for certain properties within message, I can also do that by let's say I just want to copy the invoice there and I just want to go and specify that. So I will only output that specific value as opposed to outputting all these data that I really don't need. So I'm going to go and clear the output in here. So it clears the window and let's go and stop it and then restart it. I'm going to pick the same robot. And then since I've specified the invoice there, it's only going to output that value. So not, I'm not really including other values ex except for the ID. But other than that, it's only putting that value. But let's go ahead and, and remove this since we really don't need it in this we're just going to stop. The next is we're going to be grabbing the keys from our vault. There's a if you type in vault here, uh, you can see here that there's multiple things that you can do within a vault. You can get an item, list items, or set an item. We're going to go and just grab like the keys that we have, such as the Straco key. Let's go and rename this. Let's go and rename this to get Straco key. And then we're going to be pulling this information. The options is going to be, uh, we're going to be picking the vault that we have, and then we're going to be picking which key do we want to pull it from? So in this case, we're going to be pulling it from this tricky API key. Let's go ahead and copy this one because we're going to be uh, using also this one for, for grabbing the AA table key, which we're going to be using later on when we make an HTTP request to AA table to create records. So let's go ahead and put that in there. And then this one is going to be pointing to AA table API key. Make sure that we connect both of these nodes together, still in a chain. 
The next thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be listing the directory within the folder that we've set inside the uh, global variable, right? It's going to be underneath the files package, but let's go and type in directory. And when you type in directory, it's going to see all the things that has directory on it. So you're going to have to choose which one fits whatever you need. So let's go and insert a list directory here. Now you can see that now I can assign a directory path. I can choose from all these different options. Since we have assigned the directory path to a message now that lives inside of this message invoice there, now we can go and grab that. So we can set it as an input for this list directory. So let's go and pick message here and then paste the invoices here. So now I can grab all the different files within this directory using this invoice directory. This is going to point to the path of the directory where the, the PDF are going to live. And then the output is where the output is going to be. It's going to be pulling those information from that directory. And then the output is going to be set into this message that files. Uh, obviously, you can change this to whatever type of naming convention that you want. This could be, I don't know, directory files if you have more position, but you can name this whatever you want. So you're not really tied to whatever the output is that they send here. Another thing that you can also set here is how many records do you want to select? And also you can also select which metadata you want to uh, come back when we pull the files. We can also get the modification time if you want to. We're also getting the size. More importantly, we're going to be uh, getting the name of the files as well as we can detect whether the file is a directory or just a regular file. So this is the flag for that. So I'm gonna be pulling all this metadata. Let's go ahead and debug this one so you can see the output. It's always nice to go through this automation step-by-step step so you can see what's happening. So let's go ahead and hit play on this one. Let's go ahead and click run. Uh, sometimes you get this flow, could not be saved since it's flow out of state. But you can go ahead and just hit run again and it should work just fine. It's also a good idea to clear the output all the time before it runs. But see here, that's old output and then the new output is right below it. So you can see that credentials is now being set into this object, which yes, the credentials now here. And then you can see that the files is now being pulled from the local directory. You can see here the John Smith PDF, Sarah Johnson PDF and then Michael Brown. And you'll notice here that it's also pulling the completed folder. It's also being pulled as part of the list directory. But the one thing that you'll notice here is there's a flag. There's a is there flag, which is is directory, whether it's a true or false, which we can do a filter and remove the folder from being listed here later on. We're going to go and remove this folder since we don't really care about processing the folder. We're only interested in processing the PDF for this automation, right? So now that we have all the files here, you can see that credentials is now available as well. You see that I can also get the, the different credentials for this automation. Now if you go here, get straight code key. Oh, you can see here the output is being sent to credentials. I think I named this one to straight code API key. So let's go ahead and change this one. And then the next one should be, should be AI table API key. So it's always good to Sometimes when you do a lot of copying and pasting, you tend to like mix it up. So when you run this node, make sure that it's assigning the output to the correct variable within the message. So now let's go ahead and clear this again. And when you stop this and run this again, uh, go to stop this first and click run. Yeah, so the cred credentials was overridden by the second call, by the get a table key. So now when we see this output, you should have a different one for each. So you have a Straco API key and you should have one for a table API key. And then you can grab the value from that object, which lives in this value. If you do a got get value, uh, you can see here that the, the value has been hashed. So it can hide the, the key from uh, being viewed in the output. So that's all good. We got the files, we got the, the key set up. Let's go and continue this automation. Let's go and remove this debug since we really don't need it. The next thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be filtering out 
the directory since we don't really need to process the directory we just need to process the actual pdf files let's go and remove that by introducing a function here so we're gonna have to go under to a, a programming function and then we're just gonna go and rename this to filter directory i think that's how i named it or exclude directories that's fine what i'm doing here is i'm just grabbing the files from the message and then just reassigning it back but i'm doing a dot filter on it and i'm doing this expression where i'm looking for this is there which is equals to false so i'm only grabbing the files that has an is directory equals to false we're only keeping the one that is non-directory which is a file a pdf file so let's go and save this one and close it so now i think we're ready to go and iterate through this so we're going to be introducing the for each so now everything lives in this message msg.files we can go and do a repeat on it so let's go and look for i believe it's for each goes for each it's under programming go and introduce it you can also rename this to however you want so again go ahead and rename this for each pdf or for each file whatever you want to call this and then we're going to go and set the message to the files so we're going to go and use that and that's going to be the field that we're going to be using so we're going to go and use message so you can see here that there's different options that you can use but stick with message and just put files here this is going to be object that we're going to be looping through and then the next item here that you need to set inside of the option is what you want to name the file for every time you do an iteration for a file we're going to call it file in our case so as we iterate through each files in that directory uh, we're going to go and capture the individual file inside of this message.file and index is optional in this case we don't really we're not really going to be using it but i'm just going to call it file index just to keep everything tidy remember that the message is going to be cluttered later on with all these different variables so we want to make sure that we name our variables appropriately based on what you intended that variable is going to be so it doesn't get lost in the message object let's go ahead and clear this so what we're doing next is we're going to go and set up uh, the path so we're going to go and now we got the individual files now we're going to go to the location of that file and let's go ahead and introduce a function here which we're going to be setting up for each of this path. So let's go and call this setup path. And then this is going to be, I'm going to copy this one. Let's go and go inside and replace this. So remember that we assigned the file inside of uh, this message.file. All we're doing is we're just extracting the, the file name of that file. Um, each file has a, a name, which we're going to be extracting. So you know, it could be like the customer information dot PDF. And that's going to be the file name. And then what we're doing here is what we're setting up a message dot file there, which is the location for that file. This is the full path to the actual file. So this includes the message invoice there, which is the, the variable that we pulled from the global variable that is for the, where the invoices lives. And then we're doing a forward slash or we're going to be doing two backward slashes and then we're actually concatenating the file name you can do a string interpolation here where you can do a back tick and then you can do dollar sign to do some replacement here for the different variables so we're assigning that inside the file there and that's going to be pointing to the directory where the file is going to be living in and then we're going to be also setting up the destination there which is going to be the output directory where we're going to be moving this file later on once we complete processing it. So we're just going to be doing all these setup work ahead of time so that when it's time to move that file into that completed directory, we already have the path set up into this file destination there, So which is underneath here. So the same path as the global one, except that we're adding it inside of this completed folder and then with this file name. So we're just moving from this original source to this new destination. And then we're just returning back the message and let's go ahead and save it. And that's going to be for setting out the path. So keep in mind that everything that's happening on this side now is happening within the loop. When you, for each iteration we're processing, we're going to be going through this particular node. This node we're going to be worrying about later. This is after everything has been processed. You're going to be adding an additional node, which you can have a stop once you've completed uh, going through each of the file. You can go ahead and put a stop here if you want. So in, the, in this case, actually, I added a stop here. So let's go ahead and add a stop, which after the for each occurs, 
this particular node is now going to uh, occur, which determines the whole execution of this automation. Everything goes on the top first, and then after the fact, this is going to run. I hope that makes sense. Let's go and uh, push this up for it here so I can add more nodes. So the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be uploading to Strico. Let's add some preliminary function here that we're going to be using to upload into Strico. Let's go and add a function here where we're going to be setting up the variables for Strico. I'm setting up the Strico API file up upload here on the top by specifying this. This can be found in the documentation. So this is where you upload. I added some comments here where you can't do form data inside of this function. You can't do stuff like this. So in order for us to send out a multi-part form data, you're going to have to do this type of programming, right? We're setting up the Straco upload headers here just to be more specific as to what headers are we setting this up for. And in this, we're pulling out the Straco API key from the vault. Remember earlier, we have a step or a node where we're pulling the data from the vault and then we're just grabbing the value, dot, dot value from that. And then we're assigning it to the authorization along with the bearer in front of it. And then we're setting up the content type of multi-part of slash form dash data. And then the Straco upload body is also here. So I already set up the URL, I straight up the headers, and then I set up the upload body and then we're returning that. So we're going to go ahead and save this one. And we're going to call this, I think I call this set up Straco upload just to be more precise as to what we're setting up here. So I'm adding different functions here for the different functionalities that we're doing. Next thing that we're going to do, we're going to be adding the HTTP node, which we can uh, find here. You have to go to the net package and then you would be using the HTTP request. We can also rename this to something more precise, such other than the request. Let's go and change that. Then the input would be the request body. And also you can specify the headers. Since we have all that information inside of this function, such as the headers, I can go and copy that variable name. I can go to the HTTP request here. And now I can go to message dot straco upload headers. And then for the request body, I can go and grab the, the body, which includes. So I forgot to mention that when you specify a file, you're going to have to point it to the local, local directory where the actual file lives. And you're going to be specifying the uh, file property here. And you're going to have to put this add symbol in front of it. So that's how you upload uh, a file with a multi-part form data. So we're going to go and upload and copy this upload body which we're now we're going to be setting into the request. So instead of request REQ, we're going to go and change that to Straco upload body. We don't need the custom headers since we already specified it here. We can just remove that. I believe I don't have that anymore. And then as far as the output, this is the output that we're going to be receiving back. So when we make this an HTTP request, there's always going to be a response from the server, either a status or a JSON. So now you have an option here to set those variables in place. So where you want to put the response, which variable you want the headers to be, if you want cookie, status code, and so on, so far, which we really don't care about. Um, so we can assign those as I want to be more specific. So instead of resp, I'm going to be assigning it into message.uploadresp. And then for the HTTP headers, I'm going to go and specify the upload resp headers. And then for the cookies, I'm going to go and set it to upload resp cookies. And then for the status, this would be the 200, 200, 201 status code. So we can verify later on if this call is successful or not. So we can assign those two different things. I think those are the only thing that we need. And then the, the post, we have to do a post method here and then specify the URL as well. Since we put the upload into this Straco file a upload URL. So that's what we're going to go and copy that. And let's go back to the HTTP. I know there's a lot of back and forth, but it's always just good to just copy and paste it so you don't mistype some of these things. So for the URL, it's going to go and switch to message and then you can go and paste that variable. We're not going to be selecting authentication because everything is handled on the upload response headers. OK, we don't need the credentials. We can add these like uh, different properties here. We don't need proxies. We don't need all these different options, but that's that for uploading. Let's go ahead and clear the output and then let's go ahead and stop this. 
and let's go ahead and, and give it a shot right let's go ahead and hit play and hit run actually one thing i also want to add here is a debug so i can see the output so every time you uh, chain a debug here you're going to be seeing an output of that preceding uh, node so now uh, after this completed uploading to the server uh, it should give me an output for that debug so let's go and hit run here that's um, automatically saving my flow now it ran and then now here you can inspect the output window which we've set it to up upload response it goes to this object and you can see here that there's a success equals to true and then when we save the doc when we actually send up that pdf we're going to be given the url so this is the special url that we're going to be needing later on in order to to provide context when we do a prompt completion in, inside of straco so now that we have the url to that pdf now we can use it later on to make the call right so one thing that I also want to do here, since we finished the upload, I just want to make sure that to keep everything tidy, we're going to go and put this inside of a subflow just to keep everything organized and self-contained. So this functionality, I want to keep it in one subflow. So if I want to go and remove that subflow later on, I want to interchange it or isolate it later on, I can test it individually or I can remove it as a whole. So let's go and just right click somewhere and add look for a subflow. And you're gonna be finding it here under the flow. Let's go and copy just these three nodes. Let's go and just drag it, left click and drag, and then go and cut it. Actually, let's see. Make sure we're grabbing all these three and cut it. And then let's go and double click the subflow. Now I can go ahead and paste it here. So now I'm within the subflow. Now I can go and organize this a little bit more. So the subflow contains a begin and end, just making sure that you connect the beginning of that flow again, and then we can remove the debug here since we really don't need it. And now we can connect the end of that upload into the end. So now I have the upload or the subflow for uploading to Straco setup. So like I can go back to the main flow by, by navigating. So I can go, you can go to the subflow by double clicking it. And you can see here that uh, it's organized based on this like, folder structure where I'm inside of this subflow and I can easily go back to the main flow by clicking on the name. So I think I named that one upload PDF to Straco, right? Upload Straco. So now I can change this, the colors to something else that matches like you know, the Straco color so easily I can identify it. So now I can connect that and that will be connecting to that subflow. So now whenever it encounters this uh, subflow, it's going to go ahead and execute it and then go back to the main flow. So that's how it works. So the next thing that we're going to be tackling is prompt completions. So we're going to be analyzing the PDF inside of Straco. So we're going to go and add that step. Let's go and introduce another function here where we're going to be setting up the next uh, part of this process where we're going to be analyzing this inside of Straco. So let's go and open that up and I'm going to go and copy this code, which I'm going to be talking you through how it works. So same thing that I did before, I'm setting up this message Straco API prompt completion URL, which points to the completion endpoint. It's part of your documentation that you can take a look at. And then I'm also setting up a new type of headers, a Straco headers in this case which I'm attaching to message. All these variables I'm attaching to the message. So it's available later on within my flow. I'm doing an authorization of bearer of this API key that value, which I'm pulling it from this object. And then I'm specifying instead of the, the form data, I'm going to be using the content type of application JSON. So this is more JSON type of uh, payload approach where you're sending an application JSON as opposed to form data. So I'm doing all this setup, I'm also creating a variable here, which is a prompt. So this is the prompt that we're going to be using to extract the data. So this is the same prompt that I used earlier inside of platform.straco.com to, to create the JSON uh, to extract the invoice information. So act as an expert invoice generator, return only the JSON. We talked about this earlier and then the array of services and then the total, the customer invoice and the invoice date 
is going to be represented within that JSON object. So there's going to be the prompt, which is assigned to this variable. Another thing that we're also assembling here is the message prompt completion body. So I'm setting it into this variable, which is an object, which I'm also specifying here, the models, which is an array, takes in an array of the models. So in this case, I'm setting it to OpenAI GPT-4 mini, and then the prompt would be the message. And then the file URLs would be the file underscore URLs. I'm creating a square bracket here, which is an array. And then I'm excluding the response from the previous step, what we you know, which returns back the upper response. Remember that we assigned the upper response into this variable, which we can then extract the data and then we can grab the URL from that. So that's going to be the URL. And we can use that now as a context when we send this prompt into the server. Let's go ahead and save this one and close it. Let's call this setup Straco PDF completion. Just rename this function to that so it's more readable. Next thing that we're going to be doing is let's go and connect this one. That's, next thing that we're going to be doing is same thing with the previous one. We're going to be creating an HTTP request and then we're going to be adding it here. And then we're going to rename this to Straco prompt completion. So we know that this TP request is specific to the prompt completion, right? All these variables are already set up in the previous function. Let's go and just paste it in. So let's go in. Uh, so with the, for the request body, we're going to go and pull it from the request completion body. And then for the headers, we're just going to go and put the Straco headers. So this contains the API key and all that stuff. We don't need custom headers for the cookies. We're just going to leave it as is. We don't really care about the cookies information at this point. What's important though is the output. So we want to make sure that we assign the output that we receive back from the HTTP call into a correct one. So we have to be more specific here. So now I'm assigning the output response into this completion response. And then the headers is going to be, if you want to take a look at the response headers, we can go ahead and, and put this into this cook, uh, variable here. And for the cookies, let's go and put that in completion response cookies. And then completion response status would be on this response status. So the naming of these uh, variables is really up to you. As long as you're being consistent and you're being descriptive as to what the output is going to be. So you can remember later on. Remember that our, the message object is going to be cluttered with all these properties. You don't have to be organized. And one way of doing so is to name your variables appropriately once we run this so we can go and debug this again so we can look at the generated output so let's go and clear the output and go and stop this one make sure there's no running robot and let's go and run this right okay no oh one thing I forgot to set is the URL. So if you go down to the bottom, I actually forgot to set the URL. Let's go and copy the URL here, the variable, and let's go back to the HTTP post options. So you see here, uh, you can switch back to message and then the field name would be that, the URL. But we don't need to add anything else. So that should fix that error. I keep forgetting to set up the URL for some reason, but it's part of the process. And now it's in here. You're going to see that it went to debug. I forgot to clear the previous message, but you can see here that we assigned the completion response into this variable called completion response. So we're now going to be looking for that here. And you can see here that there's an object complete response. You can see the success equals to true. And now it lives in this data and then the completions. And then it's within this open uh, GPT-4 O mini completion and then you can see all these different properties here such as the usage the price how many words and all that good stuff within the message that we receive back from straight coast api so now you can see the choices underneath the completion which is an array and then there's a single object within that array you can see that there's a message with now the content which is basically a json you can have a good idea of what this output looks like so this is a json string which contains the same output that we received earlier from when we were testing it earlier in straco so the same output so now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be extracting that string within that response by introducing another function so let's go and remove this debug since we don't really need that anymore so what we're doing here is we're going to go and extract 
the JSON from that response from Straco. Let's go ahead and introduce a function here. I know there's going to be a lot of functions here, but this is the way to manipulate the messages or the variables within RoboMotion. So now remember that everything lives on this completion response. All we're doing here is we're creating a new variable here. We would say local variable completion response, and we're just going to grab the completion response from the message. And then it lives underneath this data, underneath this data. And then there's a completions with this GPT-40 mini. I did this bracket type of uh, notation so I can work out and assign a string within that. And I can pull out the property of GPT or GPT-40 mini and then get within that. I have the completion and the choices, which contains an array. And then we're just going to grab the first choice inside of that and then the message and the content. So now we got the JSON string. All we're doing here is we're assigning the actual JSON that we receive and turning it into an object by doing a JSON.parse on that completion response string. So now we're going to go and assign it. And now it's going to be available inside of this message object. So let's go and save that. We don't have to test this part, but let's go and rename this function so we know what we're doing here. So same thing as what we did uh, previously, let's go and add a subflow here. Let's go and add a subflow here just to keep things organized. Let's go and uh, make sure that we cut all these nodes here and double click into that subflow and then paste it here. Right. So now I can go and reconnect the subflow here in the beginning of this call and then put the end here and then connect the end to where that uh, function ends. So that's going to be the subflow. And I named this flow analyze PDF in Straco. So let's go and rename this subflow by clicking on it, analyze F PDF in Straco. Okay, same thing here. You can change this to uh, whatever color you want that closely resembles uh, the type of thing that you're trying to do. That's good enough, but you get the point. So, so now we have the upload PDF in place and then we have the analyze PDF in Straco in place. So now we can connect those two. And now if I want to test this later on, I can go ahead and just detach this and then I can and continue it. So if I want to test the individual subflows or nodes separately, I can go and easily detach it now because now everything is within one scope. So now everything is scoped within a subflow. Now I can introduce a local variable here where the variable is now only available within this subflow. All right, so let's go and connect that. And then let's go and continue to the next part of the process, which is to add the records inside of a table. So let's go and add uh, another function here to keep things organized and to set up uh, a table variables. So let's go and call this set up air table, air table create, create function. And then inside of this function, we're going to go and set up a few things. Let's go and double click this function. And then we're going to go and paste this one. So same concept as the previous one for Straco API calls. I added a table records URL here, which is the endpoint for my specific data sheet. It has my specific data sheet ID and then some headers here for making a call to AI tables with the bearer that I'm pulling the AI table key value from the vault. And then I'm also changing this to content type application JSON. So if you have to go back to the documentation for a table if, if, to see how it works. But if you go to create records in their documentation, you can see the structure here where you have to send in the authorization bearer and then your token into whatever data sheet endpoint that you're using. And then it takes in a single object of records with an array and then you'll have your different fields. So if you have multiple fields, you're going to have to pass multiple objects with the fields in it. That's how you structure your records, whatever you're passing in. So if you can create multiple records in batches in a table by passing in an array of records. So that's essentially what we're doing inside of RoboMotion by doing this here at the bottom. So what we're doing here is just you can ignore the a table retry here, which I'm doing so that I can do a retry just in case something fails in the process, but you can go and retry, ignore this for now. But we're going to go and iterate through the completion. So this is where the completion was set prior. So let's go and do a recap on this one. So if you go here and go back to Straco, you can see here that the, the, the JSON string that we parsed uh, earlier is assigned to the registration completion, which now contains 
uh, the response. Now, the object that we need to add into a table is contained within this variable. So now we can go back to the main flow and go back to the to here, where now I'm pulling the invoices from that location. So I'm assigning it to a local variable so I can easily identify it. I can easily go through and traverse it without having to go through this long name. So for each of the services, I'm pushing a new object into this array of services. And I'm including the amount, I'm including the service description, which I named it the service. And then the invoice date would be the invoice date. And then the customer would be the customer name. And then the invoice ID would be the invoice ID. So I'm creating a service array here, which I'm pushing into the services array. So now once you get here to the bottom, I'm assembling the actual body, which will contain the payload so that we're going to be sending to the AA table API. So now I created a, an object here of rec with records with an array of services, which contains all the different records that we're going to be pushing into a table and we are assigning it to this a table body. So now I have the URL here, I have the headers, and then I have the payload for the a table body, right? So everything is in all these different variables. So now we can go and set up the HTTP request. You see the pattern here It's pretty much uh, identical to the previous one. Let's go and uh, add an HTTP request and we name this as add to HTTP invoice. And for the request body, let's go back here and reference it again. Um, the request body would be this one. Go back to the HTTP, be the request. And then for the headers would be this one. Go back to HTTP. And this would be the headers. So make sure that you put in the right variables here from the message. So if you're on a different one, make sure you use message here. And then we're going to go and remove the custom header since we really don't care about that. But we don't care about the cookies. We just care about the output. So the output in this case is going to be, we can name this whatever we want, but we're going to go and uh, be more descriptive about this. We're going to assign it into a table resp. And then for the headers, we're going to go and put this inside of this a table. I think I called it a table. Yep. Right there. And then cookies would be in this cookies. We don't really need the cookies, but it's going to go and be consistent here. So the output is the same. We're going to go and make the HTTP posts. And then for the URL, we'll just go and pull that from the variable. So go to switch it to message. And let's go back into the function here. I'm going to go and pull the variable again, go back to the HTTP, and then we're going to be assigning it into this URL, right? So now that's, that's been set, that's pretty much all good to go. One thing that's left is to test this out. So gonna, let's go and save this and let's go back to area table and clear, clear the records. So let's go and close this one, making sure that remove all the data that we have. We also have to make sure that the invoice are there so that we have some test PDF to work with. So let's go back to promotion. So make sure everything's connected. So let's go and run this one. So now I have the invoice directory in place. Let's go and run this. So now it's going to Straco and it's adding to a table. So now it's here. So John Smith. So now we process one. So the reason why we, it, it only process one is because we didn't really tie the repeat back into the to the next record. So in order to do that, we need to introduce a new concept. But before we do that, let's put this AI table call into its own subflow. So just kind of keep it organized. Let's go ahead and cut it. And let's go and add a subflow here. And let's go and go to the subflow and go and paste these ones, organize it a little bit and then make sure the tie in the beginning and tie the end of the subflow here. And let's go in. I think I called it add to AI table. Call it and change it to AI table. And then let's go and add that here. Right. So now the reason why we don't really go to the next record is because we didn't really make a connection to go to the next record. Right. In order to do that, we have to do a go to label. So we have to introduce this concept called go to, which allows us to go to the next record in line. So 
In this case, we need to add a label prior to this for each that we created here. So we're gonna go into the tail of that node and it's gonna go and add a label here. So we're gonna go and add label and we're gonna go and I'm gonna name this to go to next file. So go to next file. That's gonna be the name of this label. So now whenever we reach the end uh, of the repeat here for each item, uh, I'm, I wanna go and go back to that label. So I can introduce a go to which exists underneath the flow. I can go and choose that and rename this to go to next flow. I only have one label that exists in my entire flow, which is goes to next file. So if you have multiple uh, labels within your flow, you can choose which label you, you want to go to. So in this case, we only have one go to label. So let's do that. And then we can go and clear the documents again go and delete this. And then, yeah, I think that's, that's about it for this one. So after it adds the first record to add to area table, it's going to go and go to the next step, which then go ahead, goes to the next file to process. One thing that I also added here before I even start this one is because since you're dealing with multiple HTTP requests running simultaneously, you might encounter this issue, but just to be safe. So I want to add a delay here before this call to node happens. So I'm going to go and put a 10 seconds delay here just so to allow the other HTTP call that precedes it to complete before firing this to go to the next file. So just to make sure that we're not clogging out file property with all these different requests. Let's go and hit run again. Since we keep encountering that error, let's go and hopefully we didn't miss anything at this point. So you can see here that it goes to green, area table, and then now before it goes green, it, it gives you a 10 seconds delay for that process before we continue. Now it fires and go to the next step, which then did it go through? Sarah Johnson. Yep, it went through and added all of them. So four, three John Smith, four Sarah Johnson, and then one Michael Brown. So that's pretty much what the different records are that we have in different invoices that we have. So it completed, it was pretty fast. So the next thing we need to do is before we even go to the next file is we actually want to move the file into the complete directory, right? So let's go and look for move. We just you know, search for that keyword and then we're going to look for it underneath the file system. It's going to be under that file system. Let's go and click it. And then you can name this to move to completed move file to completed and then we're going to go and just join all these different links together so before we go to the next file we're going to be moving that file into the completed directory so let's go and specify the options here so the first thing that we're going to be doing here is going to be grabbing it from the original path remember that when we set up the path earlier we've set the file path to the original path to the file there and then the file destination there so we can use it when we're moving the file from one location to the other. So we're going to be using the file there, which is the original destination for the file. And we're going to be setting that up as the source. So we're going to go to the switch and choose the file there message property. And then we're going to go ahead and for the destination, we're going to go and assign it to the message and go back to reset the path. And then we're going to be using the file destination there, right? So let's go and go to that destination path. So now everything's set up for this. Now everything's been set. It's going to go through each of these files. And as it goes through each file and process it, it's going to go and move that file and then goes to the next one. So let's go and clear a table once again. And then let's go and make sure that the invoices are still intact. Let's go and save this one. And then let's go and start this automation again and fire this up. And you can watch uh, for the invoices as everything kind of runs. You see here that the, the files are being moved into the completed directory as this automation completes. And then now everything's in that completed directory. So go and check it. Everything's there. You go back to a table. Um, everything is there as well. So yeah, so that pretty much wraps it up for this video. If you have any questions, please go and leave it down in the comments. If you like this type of contents, please go and consider subscribing to my channel. And like always, click like and I'll see you guys on the next video.